Hey guys, <clears throat> I'm going to make this real quick because my voice is a miserable thing to listen to right now. Uh, because my voice is like this, we do not have a recap episode this week because I couldn't record one. Uh, I will try and make it up and maybe do a live stream or uh, just a delayed recap episode if my voice comes back. But in the meantime, we are re-airing one of our most popular episodes of all time. It is an interview I did with Jordan Castro, also known as Poopy one of the founders of Doodles. His interview was about 10 months old, so it's not up to date, but I felt like there's still a lot that can be learned from it. And there's a lot uh, that I think is still really interesting to go back and listen to. So if you haven't heard this episode before, you know, it's a fun one to check out. Uh, again, 10 months old, not new. The only other thing I'll mention before we, we dive into the episode is I launched an NFT. The OPJ NFT is available to mint now. It is an open edition. I know some of you are asking, when is the open edition going to close? Um, not clear yet because we have a couple announcements we want to make about it before we close it. However, there is a chance that when we make those announcements, we also up the price. It's at 0.065 ETH right now. So if you want to make sure you get it at the lowest price possible, go mint it now. We will include the link to the mint page in the show notes, in the YouTube description. Um, the short of it is it is backed by overpriced gin. That means you can go um, in February, you'll be able to redeem. We think February, you'll be able to redeem your NFT for a bottle of overpriced gin. You don't have to burn the NFT. You can keep the NFT, but you'll redeem it for a bottle of overpriced gin. There are restrictions in, in terms of where we can actually ship the gin to. If you're international, we can't ship it to you. There's actually about 10 states we cannot ship to either. You can find out about that on the FAQ section of our website. So please, please, I don't want anybody to be uh, misled here. If you are in a place where we can't ship the gin to you, but you still want it, we will take, we'll do everything we can to try and get it to you another way, primarily like meeting up at a conference with you and giving you the gin live in person. Um, anyway, that's just the first piece of this. We are also going to be, uh, this, this NFT will also be your access ticket to a series of events we're going to do next year. Um, that I'll say more on at another point. It'll be both virtual events and some IRL events. Um, and I don't know, I have a, I'm like bursting with ideas about what I want to do here, but I don't want to say anything. I feel like I know how everybody feels when they when they do anything with NFTs now, which is like I don't at all want to, uh, you know, overpromise anything and, and underdeliver it. This is not like a classic. I, I don't have a Discord. You know, please, please, obviously, not financial advice. Don't get into this because you think I'm going to make you rich. Please get into it because you want a bottle of gin and you want to come to some events next year that I am going to be at and uh, you want to have some fun on this journey of trying to build this. Um, yeah, so all the usual caveats, but I am excited. I will share more about it when I don't sound like this. So I really appreciate you even putting up with two minutes of, of my voice. And um, I will see you guys next time. The art is the hook. The art gets people to look and explore. But like my goal is to like Trojan horse millions of people into blockchain through, you know, through our brand. How do we do that? Hello everyone, GM, GM. Welcome to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. I'm Carly Riley, and today on the show, we have Poopy, one of the co-founders of the Doodles Project, the it project of the season, I feel like. Doodles has absolutely exploded. If you're following this space at all, you probably have heard of them. If you're very lucky, you hold one or two or many. They're uh, floor price has skyrocketed to 12 ETH at the time of this recording. Not that we want to overly focus on floor price, but it is an example of uh, how this project has just uh, really exploded over the last several months. And talking to Jordan Poopy, as he's known, I really understand why. I am so excited for you guys to hear this interview. I think you're going to love it. I think if you are a doodles holder, you're going to love it because it's just going to make you that much more excited about what's happening in the doodles ecosystem. I think if you're not a doodles holder, there is so much you can learn. Jordan, Poopy, I keep calling them both, has been in this space since 20, I mean, really 2012, 2013 in, in terms of crypto, but in the NFT world, since its very beginning, he worked on the CryptoKitties team. He led CryptoKitties for a little while. He's you know, worked on the Dapper Labs team. So he's a true OG in this space. And 
there was just so much I was fascinated by in what he was saying. So I think you'll feel the same way. He also drops some uh, alpha, some announcements, some information that uh, has never been heard before. So you, if you're a doodles holder, you're going to get some doodles alpha that you have not yet heard. So uh, really, I, I'm like very bullish <laughs> on this episode. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. I hope share it with friends if you like it, because I think there's there's a lot here. We will definitely have Poopy back on at some point. Uh, to digest the space more broadly and um, just a pleasure talking to him and, and learning more about this project. So before we dive right into the podcast, here's a word from our sponsors. When it comes to NFTs, convenience often wins over security despite scams being everywhere. Brands and artists have no other choice by complying with big marketplace terms and weak security because no good alternative exists, which is what prompted Ledger to fix the problems of NFTs themselves and launch Ledger Market. The Ledger Market provides an end-to-end -end secure NFT experience for brands, artists, and users, enabling true ownership and control over NFT assets from minting to storing. Ledger Market secures NFT projects via Ledger Enterprise, keeping you protected from phishing attacks and scams. And the market directs users to Ledger Live, where they can transact with a contract directly, giving clear signing details instead of blind signing and praying. Don't trust, verify with clear signing from Ledger Market. Stay up to date on the latest drops and marketplace updates by following Ledger on Twitter and joining the Ledger Open Discord, which is linked in the show notes below. Bueno is the NFT toolkit you need to launch your digital collectible on the blockchain without coding. Every step of the NFT creation process, from generation to mint, all taken care of by the Bueno NFT toolkit. With Bueno, you can load up your art layers, reorder the layers, tinker with rarity, everything you need to make your NFT project a reality. Bueno even allows you to mint your tokens on the blockchain with zero code and offers advanced minting logic like linking allow lists, airdropping tokens, and on-chain royalty configuration. As a part of their launchpad, you'll get access to forums to run surveys, email collection, and build your pre-sale list to make sure you are hooked into your own community. Bueno is full of powerful tools you need to build the most expressive NFT project possible. So go to bueno.art and start building your own collections today. Okay. I am so incredibly excited for our guest today. We have Poopy, also known as Jordan, <laughs> co-founder of the Doodles Project. I mean, y'all are the it project right now. So I feel very grateful to be getting some of your time today, Jordan, Poopy. I'll call you Poopy for the, the sure, conversation. Uh, given I, I, how busy you must be, thank you so incredibly much for being here on Overpriced JPEGs. I mean, it's an honor, Carly. Um, Overpriced JPEGs is, you know, a great potter. And um, I'm looking forward to giving you some some leaks. <laughs> some alpha, man. Let's get into it. Uh, I want to start just with your background because I think you're a huge draw for people, especially in the beginning who are into doodles, given your your history in this space. So for for the few folks out there who maybe don't know, why don't you give a little bit of your your background and how you got sure. into all this? I'll give the scenic route. Um so in early, I would say like 2012, 2013, um, I got into the Bitcoin and Dogecoin communities and I built a prediction market that allowed users to bet on the future price of Bitcoin um, in sort of like futures type of way. Um, I mean, yeah, some people say that you could have just like bought the currency in order <laughs> if you wanted to speculate, but I wanted to like kind of gamify it. And uh, the TLDR there is like, we started with Bitcoin, went into Dogecoin, then we, you know, got hacked, learned a lot of lessons in security, and <laughs> had to refund a bunch of users. Um, that kind of turned me off uh, from building in the space. And then the Mountain Gox like hack or kind of like just really, yeah, re really turned me off as well. Um, since then, like I kind of, you know, always been fascinated with what was going on in in blockchain. Um, but it wasn't until CryptoKitties came out. That I really like dove into Ethereum, read the white paper, um, and really understood what you know uh, smart contract programming could enable. Um, CryptoKitties took me like by surprise, and you know I'm a gamer and I love playing um, massively multiplayer games that have you know in-game economies and part of the TOS on almost every game imaginable is you know if you real-world trade, we're going to ban your account. And, you know, I was the type of person to, you know, create online gold stores, um, work with suppliers, um, source, you know, buyers of virtual currencies, virtual items, 
And, you know, I always had to like evade that, that band with my operations as, as, a, as a kid. Um, but when I saw crypto kitties, I was like, Oh my God, you know, we could, this is completely open and it's actually encouraged to create your own marketplace. Um, and not just use the crypto kitties, you know, first party marketplace that is out there. Um, so I kind of like completely abandoned gaming and went, became a full-time cat breeder. Um, this was in 2017 and I saw like a gap in, in, um, in CryptoKitties breeding, um, the genetics code was solved by Kai, um, who we both know. Yeah. And, you know, no one really kind of made it easy from like a usability perspective to understand how to breed better cats or how to breed the cats that you want. So I partnered with um, Alan Falcon, um, who's, you know, the co-creator of Top Shot. And um, we took his spreadsheet and we productized it. And you took made, Kai's uh, CryptoKitties genome project spreadsheet. Is that what you you is that the spreadsheet they're, you're referencing? They're, they're, so Kai's was like the genesis of any development that we made. So we took Kai's learnings and knowledge, expand Alan expanded upon it and created a spreadsheet that made it easy to like read a CryptoKitties genes um, through a bunch of Infura calls and just like insane shit <laughs> and. Um, we took that together and we created a web application that made it, you know, easy to, I guess, get the probabilities of breeding certain traits based on the genes that the CryptoKitties has. Um, it was Kitty Calc, and you know, more than fifty percent of breeders like used it, um, and that kind of got Rohem to like look and see, like, hey, what's going on over here? Like, come out to Vancouver so we can talk to you. Rohem and being the dev on CryptoKitties and you know, really the the oh, brain no, behind Ro it. Ro Rohem? Rohem? Rohem being the CEO of Dapper Labs. Yeah. Was Dapper, did Dapper exist at that point or was it still in Axiom Zen? World? It was still Axiom Zen, but they were forming Dapper. So they were undergoing a fundraising round uh, to, yeah. And, um, you know, Alan and I were like, oh my gosh, like maybe we could get some resources and tools or maybe they're going to let us know about the roadmap for CryptoKitties if we fly out there. And um, we flew out there for two days. The moment that we got there, they handed us an itinerary of like 20 different meetings over the course of 48 hours. And we're just like, what the heck is going on? Are we being interviewed? <laughs> like, <laughs> against our will? <laughs> yeah, without having realized it at all? <laughs> yeah. um, that's exactly what happened. Um, the, yeah, we, we basically got interviewed by, you know, the entire team at the time. There's only like, what, 20 people uh, or 20, 30 people. And, um, yeah, it, we left with, with an offer and, um, you know, it wasn't, we didn't have to mull it over or anything like absolute. Yes. Like this is our passion and, uh, we wanted to join CryptoKitties and, um, you know, since then, like Alan and I have worked on a lot of experiments and products within Dapper Labs. Um, we both led, uh, CryptoKitties at one point and, you know, i sort of led CryptoKitties like after Alan went over into Top Shot and then um, Top Shot blew up and, you know, we needed um, as much support as we could get from the wider team. So I ended up going up over to Top Shot inevitably. But in the back of my mind, like I always wanted to create sort of, um, I always dreamed of a scenario where the breeding revenue from CryptoKitties was kind of like funneled into a sort of like community treasury, a DAO, and we gave some sort of, um, we, we allowed players to govern a few levers of the breeding game. Um, mm. Maybe not the entire thing because, you know, the infrastructure still needs to stay up. Um, but like, it would be really cool for players to kind of vote on which fancy cats get added into the game or vote on which breeding events happen. Um, and breeding revenue is like, yes, it was small at the time, but it was, you know, enough to keep a small team from the community like going incentivized and you know have enough of uh have enough capital to be able to pull off events or activations um so that was always in the back of my mind um, we had like a lot of different priorities in the company and um went over to top shot and you know as i'm in top shot i'm like talking to evan this is about 2021 like beginning of 2021 and um we came up with uh like an idea just to work together on something we didn't know what that thing was and um yeah when i decided to to move on from dapper and uh we dreamt up um an nft dow project <laughs> we didn't know what it was at the time 
Like I was pushing for full decentralization right off the gate, right out of the gate. And if we get rugged or if we rug ourselves, it just, that, that is the way the cookie yeah. crumbles. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and as we're talking to more people, you know, we're talking to Kai or talking to lawyers or talking to, we just realized that it wasn't, it's a stretch. That's a, that's a real big stretch. And we ended up meeting up with burnt toast and we shared our vision for it. And, um, he kind of added, the missing piece, the, um, the, he added so much more like intrinsic motivation for us. He added, you know, appreciation for just the art itself and his process. And I think, um, that's when we kind of had this paradigm shift to like really understand that we're trying to build a brand now and not just release an NFT project. Um, So there is so much there. I want to dive into the decentralization piece the building a brand, how you go from sort of being a developer product person to being like, you know, the next Lucas films, like, you know, like, or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever the, the comp would be there. So I want to get into all that, but I think I want to start with this community side because it is obviously so central to your project, but I want to push on something because you all were in a, a Twitter space the other day with hype beast, they, they sort of being interviewed. And her first question I think was a really legitimate first question that is sort of the obvious one, right? Which is y'all are this very it project right now, but I think in general, and and, and I think very rightfully so, you've had explosive growth. I mean, you were popular from the beginning and you're one of those maybe rare projects that were super popular from the beginning and have only gotten more popular. You know, by the time I saw you guys, I think a day after mint, it felt like the floor price was like one ETH. And I was like, oh, that's so high. And now you're at like 12 ETH or, or whatever it is. And so she asked, the Hype Beast reporter was like, what makes you guys unique? Why have you had this success? And I think y'all said, you know, community. And I'm like, that's a great answer. I think it's true. Your community is obviously really important, but it's also what everyone says, right? Beanie will tell you Mm -hmm. (laughs) that what he cares about is the community, right? Or you have Blit Maps approaching community and and saying, hey, it's totally CCO owned by the the." The whole project is owned by the community entirely. There's no copyright. So that's all to say the way you all have, you've made certain strategic decisions and intentional decisions, you and your your co-founders, about what community first really means. And it's clearly paid off. (laughs) And it's whatever you're doing is working well. So I want to dive deeper on the what makes you all unique, what drew people to you, and specifically on that. What have you guys done and how have you thought about community that has work so well and been so distinct and special yeah i think um i wish we could have expanded on that one a bit more um do know, it now a, baby it's it's a stool right like it's a three-pronged or three-footed stool like community is one of them um the next bit is that attracts people is you know the artwork it's universally like appealing i feel um it's extremely inclusive like you know we have drag queens in our collection we have like just an entire spectrum of um, colors that exist in the in the doodles palette. Um, and I think the third point is like just experience in the team. Yeah. Like we've learned so much at Dapper Labs on how to run a successful project, how to build hype, how to not build hype, how to like over promise and under deliver and the inverse of that. Um, like Evan, between Evan and myself and even with Scott's experience, like we've we've been here before we know how to grow um a project into a larger ip um that was pretty much what we're tasked with at crypto kitties like when we got into crypto kitties the viral bubble popped and you know now we had to take a step back and understand how to make crypto kitties like the next mario and we Mm -hmm. have a lot of failures on that path um everything from you know the partnerships that we were shooting for uh, the markets that we were trying to enter new products that we were trying to build and games that we were trying to prototype. Um, so for us, like, I think that our early advocates, like the first you know thousand people that entered our discord really got to have a lot of one-on-one time with us um, through, you know, just us commenting in the discord or through random discord voice calls. And we were able to like instill that experience and vision into them. Um, so now it's like, we, don't need to explain this to, you know, 100,000 people. 
we have a thousand people who are on the same, who, who understand our experience, our successes, our failures, and what we want to do with the brand, um, who are kind of like mobilized to advocate for us in that way. Um, so when I say community, it's like, yeah, it's super broad. It's like, you know, it's a cop out answer almost, but like we were pretty intentional about how we created that early supporting community and like what we wanted them to, to celebrate and what we wanted them to like, um, deflate in a way. And I mean, a simple example is like, you know, floor talk, you know, everyone loves talking about the floor. Um, everyone hypes each other up and creates like this crazy expectation. You know, what about the new person that just joined who's like oh my gosh it looks like the discord's taking off i must buy now and like that is um while we're happy for people that you know are made out well um that's not something that we want to celebrate and we've even made like emojis to like you know kind of deflate it like we have past the rainbow emoji that just like completely occupies the entire discord channel and everyone just gets distracted and they're like, okay, now we're going to pass the rainbow instead of talking about reaching a 12 eighth floor. Great. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's, um, it's a little bit of how we, um, think about community. Um, we think about them as, you know, extension, or we think about our advocates as an extension of ourselves. And, um, we have a lot of experience of managing communities, the wrong way, the right way, and we're just taking all those learnings that we're super grateful for into into doodles. And what I hear you saying, which I think is really important, is in those early days of the project, you spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the people who were following you, and you had a lot of value to add to them already because of your experience in the space. So you could tell them those stories, you could get them to really trust you because of everything you'd gone through and, and the value you could kind of give them in terms of your your knowledge and, and experience. And if I'm not mistaken, you made sort of a, an interesting and critical decision, which is you locked your discord down essentially before launch without a whole bunch of warning because you liked the community that was developing. T tell me if that's right. And maybe share a little bit about that decision specifically as part of that early community building. That That's effort. right. Um, there, there are two motivations there, like to be truthful, like the first motivation is like, man, we've been asking our friends and family to join this for ages and no one seems to give a damn. Mm. <laughs> so we're like, okay, we're just going to lock it and create scarcity there. And, you know, that will create demand because we know what we have. Um, and the second motivation is for us to not lose control over the sentiment and also um, the, like, the zeitgeist or the conversation that's, you know, ongoing. Because it's so easy for Discord to, to ship and, you know, 10,000 people join, like, on mint day and... Now we just don't know, like, we, we don't know anyone. <laughs> and uh, Discord General is flooded, and we need to enable slow mode in order to be able to see people's um, comments. And I think Nate Alex's Chain Face Arena project is a good example of just completely <laughs> losing control over, <laughs> over a Discord. Um, and at that time, was there like a thousand people? Like, how many people were in your Discord when you decided to lock it down? It was like 1,100 in like 13 or something like that it was a random call that i had with evan and i was like you know what like we we're just talking like you know it'd be really interesting if we just like turned the discord off right now and just disabled all invites what would that do like i don't know demand scarcity let's see it worked <laughs> <laughs> and then since then like there's just so many like like whitelists and you know just invite only discords and I kind of like, I, I understand the, some of the motivation is to um, avoid gas wars. Um, but I also feel like there just needs to be like a better, a completely better model for this. Um, it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be gatekeepers. Um, and, you know, maybe when, when the design of these PFP projects changes away from the 10,000 model, you know, that might be an opportunity there for, to have more accessible uh, like communities and more accessible NFTs. Are you saying you almost like the, the model you helped to usher in, but which came about for you guys very authentically because you felt like, hey, we love the people in here has become now a tool that's actually being used for sort of artificial exclusivity and is and you kind of don't like that. Is that, <laughs> is that yeah. what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's used to create FOMO now. Yeah. Right. It's used to create FOMO. It's used to trade. I mean, cross pollination is always good in communities and projects, but like, you know, that's it's it's now the thing that people seek out, which is like, mm, I, I don't 
I don't know. And there's just like people who go around and just try to like mass whitelist or just join as many whitelists as they can, maybe sell their whitelist spots. And I just, I, yeah, I think it should be better. I think there should be more like, yeah, more intrinsic motivations there. Let's dive into what you learned from CryptoKitties since you've referenced oh it a couple of times and like, I would love to hear you're talking about how to build hype, how to, how to overpromise, underdeliver, how to underpromise and overdeliver. Do you have any anecdotes or like failures that you felt like you had at CryptoKitties that have been hugely instructive for you? What are like the two or three big things that you're like, when you were talking to that early community in your discord, building trust with them, what were you telling them about? So CryptoKitties, like it, it kind of, well, the biggest lesson there is, you know, the under promise and over deliver, but like, let me just get past that and talk about something more specific. Um, figuring out the motivations of collectors and understanding, you know, your, the personas that exist in your community was very, very like important for our development. Um, there are people who join just to speculate and there, but there are also others who join just out of pure joy. Like they love the intricacy of the genetic design. They might be um, breeders of other things in real life, like plants, you know, um, and they find they're fascinated by a digital cat breeding game. Um, it's under, important to understand what those personas are and what the makeup of your community is. Um, and so that you can create like in the product features or, you know, experiences that cater to more than just, you know, the hardcore speculator. If we, if that was our only focus, like we would have shipped a token, we probably would have launched Anon. Um, and we would have just, with every release, we would have done things to pump the, pro the floor price of the project. You mean with, um, with, with, with doodles, that's what you would with, have done based on the lessons you got from CryptoKitties. If you'd it, been it, like, it, we want to just cater to speculators. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we know exactly how to do that. We could have done that from day one. We could have had that in, included in the roadmap. And, but like with, with CryptoKitties taking away, um, really understanding your, your community and the personas, like it helped us suss out who the collectors were on day one and you know we had a lot of decisions to make in week one where it's like do we do we um like launch rarity tools like do we let third-party projects ascertain the rarity of you know the collection and the decision that we made is like like no like we already released ahead of the project what the makeup of the collection was you know how many custom hand-drawn doodles there are how many of XYZ traits there are. And we felt that was enough. Like what we didn't want is to create this sort of like um, new dimension of speculation just for that little artificial pump that you get when people ask, you know, when rarity tools, when rarity tools, because, you know, they want to trade against it. They want to trade on it. Um, so, you know, we just came up with an answer, like one doodle is one doodle. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's kind of... Uh, it, it kind of helped like our community move away from only focusing on speculation and just appreciating the the collection and their doodle a bit more. So in CryptoKitties, like we tried to do the same thing, um, but we, we kind of like over indexed on collectability mm. uh, to the point where we're completely ignoring speculative motivations. Mm. And in the product, like, people were just wonder like why why new feature to collect xyz or why new feature to do this what we really want is to look at the floor price of, <laughs> of certain trades and we didn't we didn't have that and because we focused too much on that collectability um so i think that the learning there is like finding that balance um and you know, that's just one of many like takeaways i mean there are launches in crypto kitties that we've had that went you know terribly wrong um uh, give me give me one more because I, I do think it people okay. will be fascinated okay. to hear what the learnings are and the takeaways and it'll be so instructive got it um this may uh, well, okay there's like three that are in my mind right now but from an optics perspective i think i'm gonna go with <laughs> i'm gonna go with the china launch go with all three kitties. okay <laughs> there, there, the there's china like launch. three three big <laughs> chapters in crypto kitties is like um first year history like there's china launch there's oh gosh steph curry cats and okay we'll start with all the of china these launch. sound great start with china <laughs> launch and we'll just move okay. through them. come on we got time man it's a podcast in the long form <laughs> um so the china launch 
China always comes up in crypto or blockchain or NFTs. It's a new market that very few understand yep. who, where the community is, you know, almost completely isolated from the community that we, we, we interact with. I'm not sure if it's because of, you know, firewalls or just like um, people in that area being more accustomed to using certain social apps um, or just, you know, language. So with the China launching CryptoKitties, there was this insane expectation that um, we're going to have, you know, 100,000 more users and people are going to come in and scoop up everything on the market that has some sort of, and this is very ignorant, some sort of cultural uh, significance with their their community. So we saw um, people really studying Chinese numerology and collecting CryptoKitties that had um, auspicious, you know, numbers. Um, we saw, like, in the product, uh, but this was, I think this was before I joined, we had um, kitties with Chinese bios. And we just, like, quadrupled down on this idea mm. and did not set um, proper expectations for ourselves and for our collectors. And, you know, ultimately, when the China launch happened, um, it really was just, like, it really fizzled out and you know we expected or the community expected a thousand x of what we actually saw and um that was you know key for like under promise over deliver or just like uh, yeah <laughs> what did a china launch mean i mean this was okay. a platform online so what does it even mean to be launching in china if it's right it it meant um collaborating with um phone manufacturers in China to be able to, um, to, to deploy the CryptoKitties mobile app in mm. Chinese, um, mm. on like on, on every device basically. So regardless of whether, you know, if you have like an HTC phone or something like it'll come pre-downloaded, CryptoKitties will come pre-download with it. And that was like one way that we entered the market. Um, and, um, there were, there were other ways too. And like, we just, I'm actually like really digging into my memory because this is 2018. <laughs> um, yeah, just the, the entire go to market strategy just, you know, wasn't there. We had one big angle and that was like uh, installing the CryptoKitties mobile app on, you know, on phones, on many devices that were very common in China. And um, it just ultimately like just, didn't convert. I mean, we still had the same problems as we see today. Like, what are the crypto on ramps? Um, how do you explain um, a non custodial wallet to a user? Like, these are all the challenges that some teams are solving right now. That were the same hurdles that um, that CryptoKitties um, users had in early twenty or late twenty seventeen. The difference with November twenty seventeen or December twenty seventeen and the China launch is. There was a viral bubble with CryptoKitties and everyone, you know, saw the New York Times headlines and they were willing to go through the gauntlet to be able to acquire crypto and breed cats. Um, with the China launch, we didn't have that viral bubble to drive that sort of demand. And like with CryptoKitties, conversion rates there, like during the uh, viral uh, bubble, it was like 3% out of all users that went to the site. And then after that, you know, it dropped down to like 0.2%. So like people were more than 10x more motivated to go through that gauntlet because they saw the headlines and yeah. everyone was talking about well, it's it. It's created that cultural buzz and that cultural, uh, the culture side of it that it feels mm -hmm. like it, it is very hard to do in a country that's across the globe from you if you don't have people on the ground and, and the people sort of, you know doing that work. <laughs> what, so what were the, the big, the big takeaways now when you think about doodles, is it partly a don't put all your eggs in any one basket thing? Is it like, Hey, we're not going to over pipe hype any one thing. Cause it's hard to predict what's going to hit. It's going to be the thing that you don't expect to hit that will hit and, and catapult things. Has that been part of the, the, what you've pulled from that? I think just being more intentional about what's going to do the most to build the brand. Um, like with doodles, we have an NFT track for product. We have, um, a consumer goods track, and then we also have like a live events, uh, track as well. So each track is, you know, in service to one another. Um, 
it's intended to create more demand for Doodles, the brand. Um, but the product should be able to like cross pollinate the you know customers in a very cohesive way. So like with Doodles, you know we have that ten the ten thousand NFT collection. Um, the reason why we're creating Space Doodles, um, which is our next feature release, um, is to experiment, innovate, learn something, but also, um, you know, give additional value to current collectors and to current existing doodles. Mm. Um, that, that is, um, that's kind of in support of like flexing our technical ability, maintaining our position as, you know, one of the top teams in the space from like a innovation perspective. Um, but, you know, Space Doodles isn't going to do anything for the million fans that don't even own, you know, an NFT. Mm. Oh, you're touching so. on so much I want to touch on. Sure. Go for it. Jump in. I want to talk so much about Space Doodles and you're doing some innovative things there. The community has reacted really positively to those announcements and, and the ways you've you really innovated around that. But I want to step back first and and talk about you know, you're building this intellectual property. And I think something you said in that hype beast conversation was, you know, in five years, you want to be the peanuts and in 10 years, you want to be Disney. And I thought that was a really cool, uh, it was very helpful. <laughs> it's ambitious. I love it. And it's very clear sort of what you're trying to build. You're laughing, but I'm assuming you, you continue to stand by that. And you're, you're laughing, hearing your own words, put put back. Is that, <laughs> is that the reaction? <laughs> I mean, I, that was definitely off the hip, but like I spent like five hours in the Charles Schultz Museum a couple months ago and just reading the history and kind of understanding, you know, the the inclusivity of Peanuts, the characters, mm -hmm. the and um, how they went from, you know, a comic strip to you know, a brand um, that was I saw I drew a lot of parallels and as I've been talking to more and more people who are from, you know, that, that space, um, sharing those experiences. Like I, I, I'm starting to see it. I'm starting to see this as like the making of that sort of like iconic, um, brand that started with, you know, a character started with a few characters. <laughs> um, but we have much more ambition than ending with that. If that makes sense. Like, hundred percent. And I, my question is actually, I think it's awesome. And I think it's totally doable. And, you know, I've, I've talked to other projects in the space. And so I know you're not alone in that sort of being the hope or the end game. And I'm wondering, how does it work? Like there's you, we, there's cool cats, there's dead fellas, like there's so many uh, projects, all that I think are amazing that are all sort of shooting for that. And, you know, to some extent, the goal is your, uh, you know, Apple TV series or your Netflix series or your show with your characters. I'm sure you're going to give a very diplomatic answer here, but do you think about that? Like, are you out pitching Netflix knowing that cool cats is next door doing the same thing or, or, you know, knowing that eventually that'll be the case? Like, how do you think about all these other NFT brands that are, that are also uh, sort of shooting for these same goals? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I don't think I'll give a diplomatic answer. Oh, good. I, I was hoping for a non-diplomatic answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think frankly, like, we really don't give a damn whether or not we sell something to Netflix or we just release mm -hmm. it on YouTube for free. Like we're the type to test an idea in the market in the quickest way possible. And if it means like we, we want to create that animation for ourselves to understand what, you know, what, what we have, what this, what story can we tell, how much depth is there into, in, into our universe that we're creating. Um, whether we pitch that to Netflix or release, you know, something that's like a, a series on YouTube, like it's really up for discussion. Like, I think, um, I think that it starts with the character. Like, well, traditionally it started with the character, like Mickey Mouse with Disney. Um, but then like, we have so much more, like we have, you know, the community, we have a successful product, we have fans, like, we don't need to go the traditional route um, and just go straight to the Netflixes. Yeah, it would be great because that's distribution to millions of people. But it's and, really about maximum eyeballs, and and in part, and in some ways, the world is changing, it, it, right? And so mm -hmm. we're seeing all sorts of gatekeepers 
tumble <laughs> in all sorts of industries in the world. And uh, it's not impossible that you see some of these other media gatekeepers be less relevant as well. Um, and so it sounds like you're saying it's not about prestige for y'all. It's about reaching people and, and making the brand relevant to people. And that can be done wherever people are. Yeah, I think I think it might be, you know, a bit too early for any NFT brand to just be like, we're going to put this in front of 100 million people or 20 million people and see what sticks. Like, I really feel you should know your audience first. And before you even do that, you need to know your story. Um, so, I mean, there's that's not to say that a bizarro version of Doodles of what we create in the next year could be released in the following year. Um, something... I, I feel like, like I want to know the story, and that's what we're working on right now. Is um, who are the main characters in the collection? Mm. You know, we don't want the main characters to just be at doodles, doodles that we own. Like we're talking to collectors right now uh, to be able to understand what their vision is for their doodles, and kind of see how we could incorporate that web into the universe that we want to build. Um, but I mean, there could be a world where we create um, an animated short. And, you know, we, we just release it to the community or we release it to, yeah, and you just get feedback on it and iterate on it. Um, there could also be a world where we just find the right partners who have the same passion and vision that we do or just a different vision that, you know, we, we kind of can relate to um, that want to take us into this, you know, Netflix, streamer, HBO Max sort of route. Um, it's very early, I think, for a lot of projects. Um, I'd be really curious to see how, you know, Cuphead does with their mm -hmm. animated series on Netflix that just got, the trailer just was released yesterday. Um, because that's a good example of having a highly successful product built in community, making its way into a different, you know, form of media. Um, the, the flip side to this question where I was sort of asking, you know, are you out there pitching all these you out there pitching and realizing that Cool Cats is next to you pitching the same thing is what I'm imagining is happening, which is you're having a tremendous amount of inbound. <laughs> like everybody in the world is like trying to figure out this NFT game and are looking at a handful of sort of the major projects. And I'm, I'm guessing Doodles is one of them. How are you managing that inflow? And what are you looking for in people who reach out wanting to be partners or wanting to, to work yeah. with you all? I think um, at the very highest level, like within the context of not releasing a new product, but let's say fundraising, because that's just, you know, every startup has to deal with that at some point or uh, ignore that at some point. Like we're looking for very strategic partners mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, people we hire or in terms of advisors. Um, we don't... <sighs> we kind of want the best of the best. Like we want people to understand that we have that bootstrapped community product that's successful. Um, but we want people to, who have like a longer term vision than someone who just wants to create something with us and sell it. I mean, if we wanted to, we could do it, you know, eight, nine figure drop, like at the push of a button almost, but like that doesn't really achieve anything for us building a long lasting brand. Um, so going back to the previous question, it's like, what, I don't understand why it has to be like a rush race to the market. You know, if 10, 20 million people who are going to watch this probably have no idea, like are not on the same level of understanding of NFTs as we are. Like it does not need to be a race between, you know, cool cats, dead fellows and doodles to make the first animated series on Netflix. I just, if you have a successful, like engaging, like, you know, animate animation it's going to do well if you find the right audience for it. Um, but in terms of like who we're looking for, um, people with that sort of like founder mentality, willing to wear multiple hats, um, but who also have experience shipping. Um, mm. Like I personally don't want our team to grow larger than, you know, 20 people for the stage that we're at right now. Um, How I big are like you right can, now? How many people do you have on the team? We're now? eight, eight people in total. Wow. Yeah. And like, do you have contractors that you work with that are sort of outside of that eight? 
So yes, we we do. Um, technically, we're all contractors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doodles has zero full time employees. <laughs> but that that is going to change because of um, the you know labor laws and health insurance. <laughs> yeah. I know because I do you want health insurance finally. You're like, uh, all right, oh, I'm sick of this. <laughs> this is yeah. This is this is like um, it's it's important, but it's also like kind of draining having to navigate all the. Um, you know, just equitable and like labor laws in different countries, et cetera. Mm. It's like, yeah. So th- that's an entirely new beast that we're just trying to figure out right now. Oh. Um, but going back, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought now. I was asking about how you determine who you decide to partner with, all the project ideas and partner ideas and hire ideas and VCs and, and everybody who's coming at you wanting a piece of this. How do you sort through that? that noise. Yeah. And, and you were saying Got you want it. somebody with a founder mentality who's like thinking long-term and knows how to ship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, willing to be on the front lines, but just a more direct answer is like, like okay, VCs on the topic of VCs, there's, you know, many people, many organizations that just want to throw money at us. Like that's silly and dumb terms. Like we don't need that right now. Like we, we really don't, we can self fund almost anything we want to do. Um, and we could also, build with the community and use tap into the doodle bank as well. Um, but like the average, like the VC needs to be able to bring more than just capital. Money. Like yeah. not, not even connections. Like we can reach almost anyone we, we need to reach right now at this stage through our, you know, our advisors that we have. Um, we're looking for more strategic, like in a scenario where doodles did need to raise a lot of capital to do something like we would want someone who, owns manufacturing end to end, but also has distribution relationships with the biggest retailers in the world. Like we're looking for people who can, we can bring an idea to and they can, and they have the resources to be able to produce it in-house. We're not looking for connectors. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, since the growth, that's what we've been seeing. It's kind of frustrating having to navigate through people who could connect you to this or person or that person. Like we've had a paradigm shift recently to where it's like, you know, instead of just like licensing our IP to XYZ toy manufacturer is very successful in Walmart. Um, why not just build it ourselves with the right partner who has, you know, millions of square feet of manufacturing and who has decades of experience doing this. Um, in more of more than a collab, more than a partnership. So what I'm saying is more like thinking more in a joint venture mentality Mm -hmm. um, so that we own most of it like end to end and we have full control over what chemicals get added into it or removed from it. You know, what type of uh, work environment the product is built in. Um, Everything from that to how it reaches, you know, the shelves. So that's very... (laughs) Uh, yeah, uh, I might have revealed too much. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm eating this up. I, I, I think this is fascinating and I think it's so helpful, so important for anybody who's interested in NFTs to see how the minds of, I think, project founders work. And I think you're so thoughtful about what you do with this project. And it's, it's really fun to, to kind of hear what you're thinking and going through in real time. And I, I think it'll bring a lot of value to people. Let me ask you too. So that was sort of talking about the the VC fi- side or taking outside money or, or those kinds of partnerships. You talked about you, you sound like you almost have departments within doodles. You talk about the NFT side, this uh, like consumer good side, the live event side. It, are you thinking about that? Like here are our departments. Are you, are you going to, you know, down the line, you'll have the animation studio side and, and, and you are building up people with the right expertise in live events and in building consumer goods is, is, you know, it feels like that ties together what you're talking about with manufacturing, et cetera. Is that how you guys view it? Yeah, that, that's exactly how we view it. Um, we, we have um, advisors for every single like vertical that you just mentioned. Um, people who have, you know, done really incredible things. Um, I'm not sure if we, yeah, we haven't released their names yet or shortlisted them. I mean, Todd Kramer was and and Geronimo, uh, Jahan was on the hype beast call, um, but that that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for people who, you know, get the vision, but could also 
help us scale out either a team internally or um, figure out how to structure a joint venture with the right partners uh, for each of these things. Like, we're not going to build a 50 person animation studio at Doodles. Instead, we're going to work with, um, you know, the best to be able to do that. Um, the same thing with uh, consumer goods and, you know, live events as well. Like, we're trying to keep the, the team relatively small right now. Um, and I think we can stay very lean, you know, indefinitely as long as we structure these partnerships or structure these joint ventures, um, um, like, in, in a good way. Um, is there is there one department you're most excited about? Are you like I'm a concert guy? I want the live events beefed up, or is are you just like you're loving? Are you loving like all of it and and the the business thinking about okay. the whole thing? Um, and then? Biased answer is the NFT. Yeah, yeah. Team. Okay, I should have like, thought so. Um, okay, so this is news. Nate Alex is actually jumping on as our Spark contract advisor, and I'm just gonna like say that's it. big so, news. I know, yeah, dude, that's amazing. <laughs> I, okay, I know. I know. Finish your thought. Yeah. But. Um, um, like Nate, Nate is trying to build you know a team of world class smart contract engineers. Um, so it makes so much sense for us to align with Nate and you know, give and take at the same time yeah. and also leverage their, you know, future ideas for our internal like NFT product track. So like, I'm super excited about that. Um, I think that's huge. Cause I think it's so clear. I don't, I don't know Nate, but I, I think I've actually talked to him a, a little bit in group discords and things like it's so clear. He's got such a brilliant technical mind and that he's so excited about innovating in this space technically, mm -hmm. and that he doesn't care as much about art. <laughs> like if you look at Jane Face's arena or Jane, you know, you're like, what that is not is like, you know, breathtaking art. And so to, to kind of bridge those makes sense because you have, you know, you have the folks in your side, you've got Burt Toast who, who do care and, you know, put so much thought into the art side. So to have him just focusing on what he loves and does so well is that's so exciting. That, yeah, that, that's definitely the thinking. Like we're focusing on what we're good at, which is usability, um, art, animation, just creativity in general. And, mm -hmm. um, we want to bring in partners like Nate to help us with, you know, the heavy lifting from a very smart contract technical perspective, um, but also like help us roadmap what we want to experiment with. Um, I mean, for me, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a product person, but I can't have my ear to the ground in every, you know, sort of like <laughs> niche of blockchain development. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> that and space also... <laughs> is evolving as fast as anything else and you can't keep track of all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then hiring, you know, hiring doesn't make sense when we have like friends and allies who are the best at what they do. Um, so Nate's team right now is himself and Kane Wallman, who actually won Sam CZ's son's Capture the Flag um, tournament. And Sam CZ's son, if anyone does not know, is one of the best white hat hackers like in the space and their documentation is incredible about what they discover. And I, I enjoy reading it. Like a lot, a lot of it can go over my head, but I just, that's, that's the quality of talent that like we want to like align ourselves with. Um, and also like offload that, that burden too at the same time. Mm. Coinshift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury, and Coinshift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With Coinshift, your organization can go from primitive, single-chain treasury management to expressive, flexible, and multi-chain treasury features, such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. We're all bullish on NFTs, but gaining exposure to NFTs as a whole is difficult. How are you supposed to gain broad, generic exposure to an industry that's designed to be unique and non-fungible? Cryptex has the answer. Cryptex Finance produces synthetic tokens that lets you get exposure to areas of crypto that you otherwise couldn't. Their first product, TCAP, 
provides broad exposure to the total crypto market cap of all crypto assets. And their second product, JPEGs, gives you the ability to get exposure to the entire NFT market. It's the first real NFT index token, so you don't have to go hunting for rares or finding under the radar opportunities. You just need to own some JPEGs because JPEGs tracks all NFT collections with real time exposure. This is a first of a kind product from Cryptex, who has worked in close collaboration with Chainlink for months to ensure accurate price feeds for true exposure. Live minting and trading of JPEGs will open at the end of Q4, so make sure you stay up to date with Cryptex Finance by joining their Discord, Telegram, or following them on Twitter. I want to get into what I see as like almost the biggest, thorniest question that any NFT project who's really looking to become a massive global brand has to contend with. And I know you think about this, uh, and I think it'll probably lead us to space doodles and, and to a whole bunch of other things, but how do you scale a limited supply NFT project, something like Doodles where you have, you know, 10,000 of them or whatever it is. And how do you reconcile that you have 10,000 of these things, but you want this to be a, a brand that reaches millions of people? How do you think about making that happen and, and how you go from where you are to, to there and like keep these people engaged when they don't own one themselves? So the cop-out answer is merch. Oh, that- <laughs> Okay. Like, I think, I, I think that's the cop-out answer. Um, you know, merch could be um, print on demand. It could be, you know, whatever. It could be scaled easily if you're t- we're talking low quality. Uh, but, but scratch that it entirely. Like, I think that um, we, we're in, we're in blockchain, like we're in web three, like there are, you know, pillars of the technology that are always like underlying in everything that we do, you know, the transparency, um, the trustlessness, um, the ownership. And when you're trying to scale your brand and you kind of like, I feel it's true to the space to be able to share those values at the same time. And for me, it's hard to share those values when I'm, if I were to just sell a a doodles t-shirt with the doodles mascot on it, Mm. um, this is my motivation as a blockchain builder to be able to share those values and, you know, onboard people into the space. Um, the art is the hook. The art gets people to look, um, and explore. But like my goal is to like Trojan horse millions of people into blockchain through, Mm. you know, through our brand. Um, how do we do that? Right now, we can't do that. We're a vanilla NFT project, you know, with 10,000 NFTs, with, you know, snapshot, multi-sig wallets, et cetera. Like, that experience is daunting for the mainstream, like, user. (laughs) Like, how how does one even buy crypto? Like, I was talking to my parents the other day, and they still don't even have Coinbase. I don't even know how they got their Ethereum. (laughs) 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 Oh, my gosh. Um, So, like... There, yes, I I always want to push for decentralization, um, but I, I don't feel like that needs to be the only thing that we focus on or work on. Um, for Doodle specifically, like, you know, we have 150,000 fans on Twitter. Um, not all of them own NFTs. Um, a lot of them, in for the ones that do own NFTs, they definitely don't own Doodles because we only have, you know, 5,800. Uh, unique holders um what we're trying to to think of is like how do we leverage the existing collection in a way that's equitable to the collector um to be able to scale nfts to a hundred thousand a million ten million people Mm. um we think we have a way to do that but it requires the right partners in the space who have built the technology to be able to you know one um, have fiat on ramps, credit card purchasing, to build a very slick and native experience that is very familiar to people. Um, MetaMask Wallet is not familiar to people. Um, and three, like, be able to build at scale, not just from like even from more than an Ethereum perspective. Like, you know, Ethereum has a bottleneck with how many, how much transactions can, or how much computation can be included into a block that, you know, that is a bottleneck. Um, So I think um, for us, we want to get our NFTs out to millions of people, but we don't want to create new, um, new doodles, new doodles. Um, 
we're trying we're trying to do that through cross licensing doodles back to us that are owned by you know collectors to be able to create not derivatives but to create to be able to create new nfts that they can sell to our fans so now we have this supply wow i think i'm this is starting to click but spell this out yeah now now we have the supply to be able to sell our job is to create the demand for that supply um and it's a way that it, it, this way does not dilute the you know collectors and their their doodles in any way instead it lets them you know bootstrap a business, if that makes sense. Totally. So let me ask, well, let me, let me ask, and, and this I think does bring us to space doodles, but so is it, is the, the concept here is if I hold a doodle, I could license it back to like doodle LLC, you all. And so you pay me some like royalty or some little licensing fee. And then you take this doodle that I've licensed back to you, create something, maybe you put it in a spaceship or you, you kind of, you do something else with that doodle, which now creates a new asset that you can sell so now you have more than 10,000, you know, sort of doodle products out there, but you haven't undermined the initial holders. And in fact, you've gotten their explicit permission and you've paid them a little something. You've given them some sort of revenue stream for that. Is this what you're describing? Exactly. And Damn, the context of it can change, that's right? That's cool. Like, <laughs> I'm going to get front run. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, uh, I'm, wa- I'm launching, you know, toodles and uh, I've got a sick idea. No. <laughs> Um, but to dive a little deeper, like, you know, the, the thing that's amazing about space doodles is like the, the context, right? It's doodles in a spaceship. That That's just like how we want to experiment with that technology. Um, but like for this idea that we're, we're speaking about, like, you know, think about like a digital Funko Pop. You know, Funko Pop has mm-hmm. its own distinct art style with the big heads, black eyes. Um, what if, you know, there was a digital very or a variation of that doodle interpreted in like a 3d art style or like a community um a community modelers like art style community artists art style things like that like um and all of this could be enabled through smart contracts as well like you could you know totally stake or escrow or wrap your you know your doodle to be able to participate in this um but well, i think we're getting me- into Deadheads, okay. have you followed the Deadheads project uh, um, at all? They, they not, basi- not deeply. They basically, they have folks stake their Deadheads into a casting pool. They choose from that pool who to cast in their show. Mm-hmm. And then you get rewarded for that staking. And, and the idea being that, you know, if they become the next Star Wars or something, like you own R2-D2, but you've you've basically leased it to them to use, but you still own own it fundamentally and could go lease it out for other purposes. So I am uh, going to buy a deadhead after this right? call. <laughs> it's, th- th- I, I don't know when, I literally just did an interview with them. So I don't know whose interview is, is airing first. <laughs> but, and they have a whole a concept called the green room where it's very cool. It, the, what they're doing technically is very cool. Um, and it, it, you know, you're doing something similar, just not only in the context of, entertainment and shows, right? You were talking about a very similar mechanism for mm-hmm. expanding the collection. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I think it's awesome. Talk about Space Doodles and, and the wrapped, it's a wrapped NFT and maybe give people a little primer on that. And um, I think it, like the who's who I feel like of people that I respect in NFT world, we're all freaking out when you announce Space Doodles and the mechanism. <laughs> so I, I feel like it's worth taking a moment for you to talk about why this is so um, sort sure. of amazing. It ties into what we're saying now, of course, but So wrapped NFTs, I've been completely fascinated by wrapping for like since 2019, since it, you know, existed. Um, The history behind wrapped NFTs starts with um, the CryptoKitties community. Um, There was a developer named Cabsian. They um, were toying with the idea of adding, toying with the problem of NFTs not having liquidity, NFTs being illiquid. So their solution to that was to allow users to wrap their NFT, their CryptoKitty, and receive a fungible token. Mm-hmm. So what this created was, you know, like now, now these wrapped CryptoKitties can be traded on Uniswap. An investor could come around and get exposure to CryptoKitties by just buying a basket of wrapped CryptoKitties. Um, 
collectors can don't need to spend the gas to list each crypto kitty well, individually oh well, sorry sorry um, collectors don't need to spend the gas to list their crypto kitty on the market and wait for a buyer to come around there was immediate liquidity through you know uniswap for example um, so in summary like it enabled new functionality on on an existing nft through um, giving your crypto kitty to the smart contract and receiving that fungible token in return that was in 2019. Um, since then, like Nate Alex came around and you know f- toyed with the idea of wrapping specific crypto kitties, um, so Gen Zero crypto kitties. Now, um, the value of the wrapped NFT or the fungible token is much higher, so people can. It makes economical sense to trade it on Uniswap or to to even wrap it to begin with. Um, fast forward a little bit, um, you know, punks. Uh, unique token that predated ERC-721 could not be traded on OpenSea. So I forgot the name of the team, but they use the same tech, wrapping NFTs. Instead of wrapping an NFT into a fungible token, they wrapped a punk into a conforming NFT. Yeah, that that's how I feel like most most people, if they've heard of wrapped NFTs, like I think of wrapped strikers, right? Think of it as these projects that predated sort of the ERC-721 standard, you know, mm-hmm. now wanting to be on OpenSea. I didn't mm-hmm. know the full history, so keep going. It's it's very interesting. Got it. Um, and, and that was very, very popular. But, you know, with I, I, I don't know where that project ended up. I think people still just ended up using Larval Labs's, you know, zero fee marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, you know, the NFT explosion happened in 21. And, you know, Mooncats got... Um, got dug up from, <laughs> <laughs> from from the archives of NFT projects and, you know, acclimated moon, moon cats came around. Um, there are other projects, I think, that are experimenting with wrapped NFTs. Um, the way that we're doing it a bit differently is instead of just letting you wrap your NFT into another NFT, we're actually reinterpreting its art almost completely, um, giving you an entirely new piece of artwork from Burnt Toast, um, but also giving you on-chain stats and properties that allows your, you know, space doodle, which is also your doodle, to be used in, let's say, some sort of experience that makes use of those stats in the future. And like, mm. hypothetically um, speaking, because <laughs> yes. it seems like you're <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> clearly implying there will be cool experiences. Yeah. And so the, the mechanism here is: I have a doodle. I can now wrap it, and it will change its look into a space doodle. It'll be a doodle in a spaceship, for example, with all the new art that comes with that from from Burnt Toast. And then I can also choose to unwrap it again and and bring it back to being my original doodle. So it's a way to evolve the look of my doodle or change the look of the doodle. But it's non-dilutive is the term that you know, keeps yes. coming up, right? Because it's not actually adding more NFTs to the collection and therefore diluting the original 10,000. And so it it's non-dilutive in the sense that there are it's not adding more nfts into the circulating supply um there are new nfts being created mm, but mm, mm. you know one can only exist in a user's wallet at any time you can't sell the space doodle separate from your own doodle they are the same person changing outfits <laughs> exactly exactly and we caught some flack around the coupling of it mm. um you know, some people are expecting an airdrop from us. They're expecting mm. to receive this entirely new NFT that they can then liquidate. Um, we have our reasons as to like why we did not go that route. Um, I think um, just taking a step step back, w- the for from the non non dilutive aspect, like to me, what's really interesting, which I don't I don't know how this will play out, is you know how does the circulating supply affect the the marketplace like now mm-hmm. there's two there's two collections that exist there's the doodles collection and the space doodles collection as more doodles are getting wrapped into space doodles less doodles can you know theoretically be listed on OpenSea or any marketplace because they're escrowed by a smart contract like what what happens then i don't i don't really know <laughs> hmm. um but like the space doodle always has a pointer back to its pilot, which is you know the original doodle. So in its on-chain properties, like pilot will always reference you know its its doodle. 
um i'm just like thinking right now and getting a little bit into the weeds but um like wh what happens in a scenario where your space doodle can be wrapped into you know a planet or your space doodle can be sent into a planet to do something now we're like three layers deep um so that's an example of scaling it vertically um what happens if we scaled it horizontally? So instead of going into a spaceship, you know, your doodle is going into a brick and mortar business in the metaverse to do something. Um, now your doodle can jump into your spaceship or it can jump into um, XYZ business in the metaverse. Um, it, it gets really interesting. It's like, yes, if, if gas allows, it can, we can do really exciting things. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a innovative way to extend like the experience and introduce new content without having to, um, dilute the collection, the brand, the characters themselves. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's so much there and I almost want to, I'm like debating if I want to, I want to push deeper, but I also want to be mindful of time. And I know there's a couple other there's probably one more big concept we want to get to, but so let me just ask this. When you talk about the, how it evolves horizontally, hold on, I have two different thoughts and I'm, they're competing for <laughs> top billing right now. Um, when you talk about it going into the metaverse, how, what is the wrapped, how does the wrapped component factor into it going into a brick and mortar metaverse building? Because you're not necessarily evolving the doodle NFT at that point. Or am I missing something? Yeah, no, that was me just like brainstorming and shooting off the hip. I've never actually thought of that mm -hmm. um, until like a minute ago. Um, but what I was trying to get at is like, what if they're inside of, you know, XYZ metaverse, there is a bakery and, mm -hmm. you know, your doodle has an apron somehow mm -hmm. and um, or a chef's hat. These are not traits that are in the collection. I'm just giving you an example. Mm -hmm. um, you could possibly just send your doodle to work in that, you know, in that bakery or wrap your doodle and have it wear a chef's hat and an apron so that it can be used mm. in whatever this bakery is. Um, it's pulling on a lot of threads, like, like composability, for example, interoperability. Yeah. Um, so I'm like totally glossing over that. But um, I think that just enabling new functionality through wrapping is like, could, could be one direction that a lot of projects take in the future. Absolutely. And that's what I was going to say is my takeaway of one of the reasons this feels like a big deal and impactful is, is because it does, it, you know, it allows for different forms of self-expression that NFT collections up to this point or PFP collections up to this point haven't really allowed for. To your point, I mean, your, your bakery example is perfect, right? Like I can express myself now as part of my digital identity you know, as a baker or in a spaceship and as an astronaut, or, you know, I can, any number of those ways that we want to morph ourselves online, just in the ways that we morph ourselves in real life to have different identities. It feels like you've sort of presented the first example, you know, of, of how that might work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why the people who were really excited, like kind of blew their minds. I, I think, I think that's what it is, is, is understanding that and seeing that long-term potential, however it plays out. Um, does that feel right? Yeah, it, it does. Um, it, it really does. I just on the interoperability, composability piece, like just imagine like nothing is stopping another developer from creating a racing experience that lets, you know, an ape, a cool cat, a dead fella, a doodle get their own spaceship. Like, I'm not saying this is like a in a vampire attack perspective. I'm thinking about this in like a composability perspective. Like, mm. why not? <laughs> like, mm. that could be an entirely new, you know, project that's kicked off that has four bootstrapped, four N bootstrapped communities, right? Like, I think I think that's cool. Like, I'm, really cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, I want to turn to the question of decentralization because I know we're we're a little over time as it is, and, and oh. this feels like a big topic to dive into. You mentioned at the top of this episode that your initial dream was like we're launching this fully decentralized project. That's it, you know, and that 
realistically, that hasn't been exactly how it's been able to play out. Mm-hmm. I would love to talk about what you've learned and about what's what's maybe feasible or not and 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 how the decentralization question has played out for for doodles. I think um what's changed is the motivation. Um, hmm. Initially, we wanted to launch a sick NFT project that's yeah. fully decentralized <laughs> that can implode at any moment. And it's kind of our like our um, entry into the space as individuals. Um, that, uh, yeah, that really, it didn't get deflated. It just the motivation changed. Like when we started talking to Scott and we started seeing, you know, the concepts, the art, like we just realized that we, and we started getting getting to know Scott as well. Like we just want to create something that's lasting. We want to create legacy together. Mm. Um, feels like the motivation matured. Like that feels like a, a more sort of mature <laughs> approach. <laughs> I want to build a lasting brand, a legacy, something I can really sink my teeth into rather than like, yeah. let's do it, brah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but like the decentralization bit, it, it's always a balance. Like in anything that we do, there's always like you're, you're sacrificing or you're, you're balancing decentralization with usability. You're balancing decentralization with you, yeah, user, user experience. Um, you're balancing decentralization with the ability to interact with meat space too at the end of the day. Mm. Like it's, it's, um, we, for us to achieve our vision, we need to have more control over how, you know, doodles operates. We need to have more control over the treasury. Um, and, to be protected too at the end of the day. Like one example is um, when we created our multi-sig, I wanted to implement this reality uh, I, reality gnosis module. Um, what that would allow is execution of code after a proposal gets uh, passed. And that execution of code is typically like transfer ETH to this address. So, you know, that could have made it trustless almost. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, like there are, that could have also like rugged the entire doodle bank if, mm-hmm. you know, something were to happen. And we, like when we had that mind, mindset shift to actually create a brand, you know, in your words, like you have a more, like be more mature about where we want to take the project. Um, we cannot like have that as a risk at all in any yeah. way. Um, so we, we made a very intentional decision to be centralized. Um, and I'll, I'll say it like we're, we're centralized and our community trusts us with a lot, um, trust us to be the stewards of the brand, um, and to continue growing, you know, the ecosystem. Um, but I think there's a point in the future where we give back control. Um, and I don't know if it looks like, you know, an experimental fund that goes back to the original like idea where it's like, here's a thousand ETH. Go ham. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I think that's interesting, though. I think that's really cool. Um, And yeah, I have a close eye on like projects like Nouns and just like other NFT DAO projects just to see like what they're doing. And, you know, I talked to Kai as well. And like I see the hurdles that, you know, me and DAO is going through and I try to learn from them. Um, But I just think that we're just, oh, go for it. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your thought, you think. I, I just think that we're, we're just not ready for it yet and it would be a detraction from what our you know north star vision is um, which is get the brand in front of millions and to millions of households yeah this is something i've been talking kind of a lot about on the podcast really over the last couple of weeks talking to the dead heads project i, I talked to a kind of intellectual property expert uh, on today's episode and and really um you know, understanding what these different models look like and what bet you're therefore making. You talked about if you're making a bet on doodles because of the the centralized nature to the, to the extent that it's centralized. And I, I know you're saying it is, but there also are, are, you've got the doodle bank. You have some serious decentralization components. Yep. Um, you're making a bet on you guys as a team, yep. as opposed yep. to a blip maps or cryptodes. And that there's also a lot of legitimacy to those projects, but you're making a very different bet when you buy into those projects. You're making a bet on the collective. You're making a bet on a Mozart emerging from somewhere and, and choosing that particular art to, to, to drive it and make it relevant. Like, and, and understanding the different bets you're making, I think is, is really important. Um, and I think, you know, I, I work with me, style with Kai, and, and I think we've made similar decisions, which is, um, uh, trying to be decentralized as possible while, while shepherding a vision. Um, mm-hmm. you talk about it with, with, 
you know, hiring, you, you do put it to the community to approve funds for different hires and, and salary ranges, I think. But at the end of the day, you have a, a team of you that are, are making the determinations around who gets hired, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk, just say a few words on the doodle bank and, and sort of how that functions. And, and I think that's your, your compromise <laughs> mm-hmm. on the decentralization centralization piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the doodle bank is a community treasury, um, you know, it, its purpose is to help us scale the team, but also, you know, fund creativity and ecosystem development around doodles. Um, you know, we have 2000 plus people, um, subscribe to the snapshot and, um, you know, some of our votes have a turnout of like, you know, 20%. Um, and it's really like, it's really been used for many things and it's evolved over the last 90 days. Like initially, you know, the types of proposals that we would see, oh, well, first let me speak about the process. So the process is, you know, a community member, ourselves, the collector um, puts forth an idea, you know, they try to farm dissent among the people in discord or the forums. And once that idea is a bit flushed out, once we know how, you know, it, how, who can champion it, how it could be held accountable, how it could actually realistically be, be shipped, and what the value is to collectors, Doodle Bank, and um, the brand, then we can like put forth a proposal, or the collector can put forth a proposal to unlock those funds. Um, we work with the best proposals, the proposals that actually pass that initial round of voting, to flush out a more final proposal that actually does unlock it and transfer the funds into wherever uh, wherever it's going. Um, early on, you know, we saw a lot of ideas that were just um, pie in the sky. We should build a game. We should build this. We should build that. And um, we really had to like work with the community and kind of help them understand that we need like we we have a lot of talent in Doodles. People who have experience from production to um, coffee roasting to just just everything imaginable. We need you know, a champion, we need somebody with subject matter expertise, somebody who has, you know, done whatever the idea is before. Um, And we've tried to make the proposals a bit better and more fleshed out to go. So one of the questions that people ask is like, who could actually run this? Like, who do we nominate? And we go to the person, we're like, will you be willing to to do this? Um, Anyways, so like a couple of the proposals that have passed are unlocking funds for scaling our team. Um, in that proposal, we listed out the roles that we wanted to hire for, um, the amount of money that we needed. We were a little ambiguous about the makeup of of where that those funds are being distributed. And all I you know would say to that is we have to pay market competitive rates to get the best talent. Yeah. Um, so that's always dynamic. Um, but um, yeah, we 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 we've tapped into the funds. Um, community developers have tapped into the funds as well to create their own you know, inspired uh, NFT projects. And um, just even artists have tapped into the funds to reinterpret the art style to be able to like create pixel doodles, you know, that are animated that can be used in, you know, World Wide Web um, or other like 2D, you know, metaverse experiences. So it, it really is a fun for creativity. And, you know, it's all, but it's also a fun for helping us grow and scale the team. Like one big learning that we kind of screwed up on is, um, we did not allocate a percentage of the royalties into Doodles, uh, the corporation or the LLC. Mm. <laughs> so like half of the royalties, you know, go to Doodle Bank, half of it goes to founders as royalties. So we're trying to figure out how to restructure that right now. Mm. Um, so like like in, in meat space, like on the balance sheet for the corporation, there's like zero dollars. <laughs> Doodles is broke. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that, that's a learning, but we're fixing that for 2022. Um, but uh, in in with that sort of like dual purpose comes a lot of confusion too. So it's like, you know, some community members think that this fund is for only ecosystem development. Why are you hiring and not using royalties? Mm. Um, and um, so that that's something, that's one of the big problems that we want to like, you know, clarify, fix uh, for 2022. But I mean, to date, we have like four successful proposals so far that have added a lot of value um, that people just genuinely just really love. Like Pukenza's 
shipped three days before Christmas and uh, the holidays. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, you know, something it, it, it really is in support of our own internal product roadmap. Like, I think it's great. It's like, it's a very heavy, like incentive layer for this sort of development. And um, while we're building space doodles, for example, like, you know, four or five doodle bank projects will ship. Like that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. And so uh, as part of this whole conversation, decentralization, centralization, and um, you talk, I think you referenced noodles, like a derivative project and, and, you know, thinking about all this is obviously the question of, of licensing. And I think my understanding of the doodle license is basically you, you obviously own your own particular doodle and you can commercialize it up to a hundred thousand dollars. But if you, uh -huh. you know, build a million dollar brand or want to build a million dollar brand out of your doodle, that's sort of off the table. And that's, that's where you guys are, are more centralized. Is that, am I properly reading what your, the terms are and what you own when you buy a doodle? Yeah, that, it's exactly that. There's no promise for any future, you know, tokens, any future yields, um, stake in whatever the revenue is generated by Doodles, uh, the corporation. But like the reason for that license is because we were learning a lot from Board Apes at the time mm -hmm. on how people are going to use this very permissive or their very permissive license. Yeah. Um, and we feel like we can always give more, but we cannot like add more restrictions to it. Yeah, yeah you so we can't started take off, away. Exactly, exactly. So like the whole 100,000 thing, like, you know, we, we forked Nifty license and we created the Nifty license while we're at CryptoKitties and we felt like, you know, rather than say this is the, the license forever, like let's use this as a starting point. Let's see what ideas are coming from some of the collectors that want to, you know, make more than 100,000, want to invest more than that much money into building out their Doodles brand. Um, and let's kind of craft it from there. So yeah. like, we're like super open to, you know, extending the license. We're super open to cross licensing. We just need to see more of the use cases and like actually have um, visibility into, you know, how an alien gets animated because we have great ideas too on how its head should turn or how mm -hmm. it raises its, raises its arm. And we want to be able to talk to these people and like, help them out at the, at the end of, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a jump off point for sure. Um, and we're looking at, um, creating like a, you know, first pass at what that extended license could look like. Mm. I, I think it's smart. I agree. I, I think it, I think that's how me is. I think it's commercialization up to like a hundred thousand dollars or something. And, but, and, and I think in your case, probably more so than Larva Labs. Like there's an, there's an open line of communication there where I think if, you know, you wanted to, somebody wants to build a bigger business, I think you're saying you guys are open to, to having that conversation, but starting, starting a little bit more restricted. Uh, okay. I want to do maybe call it a lightning round or just a couple kind of okay. ending questions that are probably not actually lightning quick, but you know, it, kind of boom through them. Hopefully. Um, I'm curious where you think the space is going in, from a chain perspective, if you're super bullish on L2s, obviously your partners and ex, you know, ex colleagues are built flow and you, know, you talk about a fiat on ramp, you know, they're doing that. Uh, what do you think is the future of, of the space from a chain perspective? Oh gosh. Um, uh, I'm like lightning round. Now here's the biggest philosophical yeah, 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 question yeah. about <laughs> Ethereum. Uh, have, you, have you read Vitalik's post about multi-chain um, I have no, I've, I've heard sort of summaries, but I have not read it okay. myself. Okay. Yeah. I've heard summaries too. I've always thought like the future is multi-chain, multi, multi-wallet. Multi I think some chains are going to be better than others at, you know, certain things. Um, I feel like right now, you know, it's super fragmented. People are competing for market share. Chains are still trying to find their use cases and not go down. <laughs> um, I think that Ethereum will exist as a settlement layer for very important things, you know, in perpetuity. Like, I also think that it's highly inaccessible right now. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, like, I just, Ethereum is a chain for people with some money, like, or a yeah. lot of money. Like, that, that's just how I see it. I think um, in the next year or two, I think another, you know, another chain might actually come up as a competitor for entertainment, for NFTs, um, do you have a I, hypothesis I, as to which one? Is there a specific one you have in mind? Ah, uh, I don't. I don't actually. I don't. Okay. I just. I. I think it's ripe, though. I think it's ripe for the taking. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I've been waiting for proof of um, proof of stake or ETH two for like four years now. Mm-hmm. So like I I I don't know this year, uh, right? <laughs> We're getting it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's so funny because like because I think I made I made a joke like that when I first joined Dapper Labs to Dieter, Dieter oh, really? Shirley, who's the architect of Flow. I was like. <laughs> are you sure it's this year like or something like that and here we are four years later yeah not a dig like i love ethereum like i'm very much like planning to build almost everything on ethereum because you know a doodle is worth so much right now it makes sense um but um yeah i just want to see how they ship faster and kind of solve that problem Mm -hmm. if they can't i think another chain is going to come to market or take more market share from away from them um are there other projects you're eyeing right now or drawing inspiration from, or are you still like a trader of NFTs or are you like so heads down on doodles? You really don't have time. So I don't DGen anymore. I mean, earlier this year, I used to DGen with Evan, uh, mm. who goes by Tulip, my co-founder. Mm-hmm. And like since starting work on doodles, like I just stopped entirely. Um, but I am looking at like, some of the hand-drawn NFT collections from huh. artists, like, you know, like low volume, like a thousand, two thousand, et cetera. Um, I've been looking into that and just really, really reading more about like their stories and actually meeting up with some of the artists in person and like hanging out with them. And yeah. So I'm kind of like bullish on like, I'm not going to say names because I'll, I'll pump bags <laughs> and, don't I, wanna, and I actually own it. Don't want to move markets um, too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just, finding art that resonates with me and learning more about, you know, the artists and their stories. Like that's, that's been my jam lately. And also to like the random NFTs that are trying something innovative and new from like a smart contract or technical perspective. Like there, I'm not going to say the project name, but there was one NFT project that I like fell in love with in my little circle of friends of like 15 people since 2017. Like I've been trying to shill it to them and nobody listened or cared and it was only until like one of the recent events to where I found out that one of my closest friends launched it as an Anon project. And like everyone thought that de- something happened to the dev because like the money is still in the smart contract. It hasn't moved. The dev disappeared and the dev came out of nowhere too. And I was like, like opening up to them like, man, like I'm actually kind of worried that something happened to them because I checked the contract, the money's still there, blah, blah, blah. And they told me like I hate to break it to you, but that's actually my project. And I'm like, oh my god! Wait, and you won't tell us anything more about it? I can't. I can't. I, can't. Oh, I think I'm the, I think I'm the only person that knows this. Uh, wow. Oh, but yeah. like, what what uh, what validation that like you have you know your right group you know like that you guys admire each other's work and um, you know obviously like <laughs> like it's proof you really do uh, you do hang with with the right people for you. Uh, okay, last question. Do you have uh, like one main big piece of advice you give to new people in the space coming up either as investors or as folks who want to launch a project? I'm sure you get asked that all the time, but like everybody wants the success of something like a doodles. What's your, what's your big piece of advice? Oh, um, okay. So for me, when I, my, my own, um, I guess heuristics for assessing out a project that's going to be completely different than anyone else's I feel, but like. I really just look at the roadmap. I just, I just look at mm-hmm. how many buzzwords they're using, how feasible it is in my head based on my experience, you know, at Dapper Labs with Doodles, et cetera. And I can just like get when there's just over promises. Like, mm-hmm. And so the inverse of that is like definitely um, from a project creator perspective, like any single word that you say will be read between the lines. People will hold you to it nothing ever escapes the internet and there will always be that one user that truthfully believes it or just believes a stretch of whatever it is that you said that does not make any sense so just being cognizant of that because like everyone has different circumstances and you know we're dealing with real money at the end of the day so it's like be very careful with what you say and i learned these hard lessons at crypto kitties like alan is kind of reinforced alan falcon is reinforced into me like words do matter. Like mm-hmm. the difference between this word and that word can mean something entirely different from a collector's perspective. And they have like a pretty significant stake, vested stake in the project too. So, um, but from like a, a DGen or collector's perspective, like everyone says this all the time, like 
team art community, but like breaking down, you know, team, just really look at like experience. And, you know, one of the hardest questions to ask somebody who's a project creator is like, where do you see this in five years, 10 years? And as a project creator, like who's trying to bring on advisors or, you know, managers, partners, et cetera, ask them, where do you see us in five years, 10 years? Mm. And if they don't have that, you know, that vision, you know, maybe that's something of concern. Um, but it also doesn't apply to everything too, because like, you know, like Nate Alex's projects, a lot of them are just one-off experience experiments. Um, so really just understanding what the creator's vision is and then, you know, going, going from there. Wow. Well, I love it. This has been awesome. I honestly wish we had like another two hours to go, but I, I want to be respectful of, of your time. And I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate this. I really like, again, I have a thousand more questions I would love to ask. I think you're doing so many amazing things in this space and bringing so much of this insight to this conversation. I'm just very, very grateful to you. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Carly. This is great. I had fun too. I'm like okay, smiling. Good. <laughs> good. Well, and uh, you know, I'll hopefully see you in Texas for some South by Southwest. I know Doodles has big things planned, so uh, would love ooh, to ooh. to pop by and maybe we'll we'll have we'll get to meet IRL. For sure, for sure. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Poopy. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.